then our second speaker is uh, Devapriya Chattopadhyay. Uh, she is associate professor at uh, Earth and Climate Science Department at ISR Pune. She obtained her PhD from University of Michigan, and her area of research is marine organisms, their behavior, and their fossils. I request uh, Devapriya ma'am to share her experience. Uh, you have to really pardon me because I am uh, three year old in Pune. And I cannot speak Marathi. I understand 70% of it. So I'll speak in English. But I can understand Hindi and partly Marathi. So if you have questions, I can definitely answer it. Okay. You have seen some of these pictures? Yes. yes. Right? What is common between them? They are all? They are not all endangered. They don't exist. They are all extinct. Okay? So, now the question is, how do we make movies out of them? I mean, one part is technology that we make things look like that. But then the question is, nobody has seen them. Right? So, how do we know how did they look like? What did they do? Did those, you know, elephant-like thing, we call them mammoths. Uh, did they actually move like elephants? You were saying yes? Okay. Uh, how about uh, those dinosaurs? How did we know that their necks are actually going up and some of them ate vegetables? Some of them actually ate, will eat people as the movie shows. How do we know that? Have you ever thought about it? Okay. The answer is fossils. Okay. Fossils means it's some record of animals and plants, any living thing. Now I'll ask a bigger question. That bigger question is, you know, how things get preserved. Okay? Uh, let's say I uh, leave a plant, you know, any plant that you can think of, or any animal that you come across, maybe a chipkali. Okay? You leave it outside once it's dead. What's going to happen next? You will see some of the other animals moving towards that. Who will be those animals? Ants. Ants, right? After some time, what we will see? Ants ate part of it. Then what's going to be there? What are you going to see? You are going to see the skeleton. Right? You wait a few more days, you will see nothing. It will appear as if everything vanished. Now, first question, how are we talking about dinosaur bones? or dinosaurs getting preserved and then we are saying we know everything about how they moved, how they walked. We cannot even talk about a three day old skeleton of Chipkali. How can we expect things to talk about like 50 million year old, you know, fossils? Have you ever thought about that? Okay. So we have to somehow preserve things and that doesn't happen naturally. It happens naturally but very rarely. Okay, so let's talk about some experiments. Uh, <coughs> so we talk about this chipkali, which will literally vanish if you leave it outside. And the same thing is true about all the food that we eat, right? If you leave it on your kitchen table, after a couple of hours, you will smell bad things. Then eventually, if you leave it like that forever, it's simply going to disappear, right? The bacteria is going to work on it, uh, the ants are going to work on it, probably some lizards are going to work on it and it's going to disappear. Now, but things do not disappear and you keep on eating stuff after five days, sometimes after years. How do you do that? What are the things that we do to them? So, give me an example that you collected or somebody collected maybe a year ago, but you are still eating it. Do you know any such thing? All of you use it. All of you eat it. Pickles. When did you collect that mango? When did anyone collect that mango? Probably a year ago. Probably maybe more than a year ago, right? So how come that survives as a good thing and you can eat it? So what are we doing there? 
preserving. How do we preserve? In pickles, what do we do? We put salt. Anything else? Oil. Anything else? It also has a, an acidity to it, right? So, part of the preservation is that you stop a process or a diff kind of change a process of osmosis. Have you ever heard of this term? So that you know the water balance is slightly changed. That's one. Often if you put a lot of salt that you know kind of takes care of it. Second thing is we also play with pH balance. That's the acidity right because certain type of bacteria cannot live unless the pH is at a specific range. You change the pH, at least you will exclude some of the bacterial water, right? The other thing is, let's say a bacteria lives in the air and you create a layer which doesn't penetrate. The air cannot penetrate it. That's the oil. Often these kind of combinations protect stuff, okay? So that's number one. Number two, uh, what do you do with, uh, let's say, the things that you made uh, last night, but you plan to eat it to, today, maybe in the afternoon? Fridge, right? Again, what do we do? We put it in a climate controlled stuff where the temperature is so low that again, the bacterial growth is relatively less, right? Okay. There are other techniques too. I mean, people sometimes do vacuum sealing. Okay, they put it in a very thin plastic layer, take out all the air and then the air cannot penetrate it and things stay as it is. Fossils are not very different. They actually happen like this. Okay, so generally uh, fossils are things which uh, you know look something like that. They don't look very fancy often. Um, they are just remnants of past life and mostly they can get preserved if they are buried under some sediments, okay? So you crush a rock that makes the sediments. Sediments cover it that at least at the beginning will stop the air interaction and that can lead to fossilization. Sometimes uh, the thing is uh, things happen something like this. It can be a living fish and then eventually of that living fish the flesh will go out only the skeleton will remain and then you put these sediments over time probably that skeleton is going to get preserved okay and therefore the normal fossils that we get would be things which have are with skeleton okay so some of these clams sometimes you will get bones uh, sometimes you will get some of the you know wood which turns into a fossil sometimes you will also get weird looking features and some plants. But the ones I talked about and what we are really curious about are these big animals. Sometimes when we even get part of the flesh in the fossil, how do we do it? And what I'm saying is, it's all about this natural kitchen. So first is refrigeration. You know, it happens naturally. You go to the southern uh, or northern part of the entire earth, you'll find there are large ice sheets. And in those ice sheets, there were times when there were large elephant-like organisms which used to move around, the mammoths. And some of them actually fell trapped between the ice. They got covered by the ice. And you get these kind of fossils. This one is called Yuba. It's a baby mammoth. And some of these examples even has grass inside their intestine, which is still green. So it's a massive natural refrigerator. Simply put it, it leaves it untouched for 30,000 years. These are generally of that age. Second one, shrink wrap. You remember I talked about this plastic film? These are animals, I mean, these are, you know, mosquito-like things or insects often get preserved in something called amber. So amber is tree sap. So if you poke a tree, often you'll see this sap is coming down. 
initially it has very low uh, density and very low viscosity so it wraps around everything that it touches that means no air is being you know it basically covering it without any air layer and then it hardens so now that insect is not interacting with outside air so no bacteria okay this is basically a vacuum seal that we use in kitchen third one pickle so these animals got preserved along with some of their skin intact in a place where the ph is extreme so half of the bacterial population doesn't grow there okay second is it also has natural oil if you ever heard of petroleum petroleum means oil from rock petro means rock so this rock oil doesn't always look like a pool of oil it's actually inside the rock layer and it can also contribute so you make a natural system where there is oil where there is a you know vast amount of ph which is shifted towards a more you know acidic level to get all these animals with skins intact okay and this is generally what we look for when we try to understand how this animal looked like even though we have no living representative of it is that clear up to this point but still i haven't answered how did we know that the dinosaurs moved right okay there is another type of fossil which is called a trace fossil which shows that it's just just the remnant of the activity how things moved how things you know uh, went inside uh, the sediments or things like that and these are very interesting because for example these ones they are trackways when you walk you leave some footprints right does that footprint tell you anything about how you looked like no but probably it can tell us something about what, whether you were walking or you were running do you know that i didn't know that when i was uh, in school do this experiment when you are next time on a running field okay <coughs> choose a friend who is um, you know who runs and choose another friend who prefers to walk okay and you will be the referee you cannot participate because you have to take measurements so then you can put a little bit of color on their feet and ask them to run and then you will mark where their footprints are you can see the footprints also do that for the person who is walking you will find that if they are of the same height when somebody is running versus walking the distance between the two footprints are different you promise me you are going to do this experiment right okay now if you do that you are going to see a relationship now but we don't like to have all of the people of the same height especially i don't because i always feel then i'll be excluded uh, everybody is going to look for taller people okay so i want something which will include everything all kinds of sizes right so there is a way of dealing with it you input it with different height and then also you can find out what is the relationship and people have done that for dinosaurs okay so there are a lot of dinosaur track rays that are in the fossil record that people have found they looked at the real dinosaur uh, fossils the skeletons and they also matched it that whether it's possible for them to make it now they have categorized different kind of dinosaur and how what the footprints they make okay now if you do that then you can do something called a stride length and leg length which is exactly what i told you so basically between the two alternative uh, footprint the distance is called a stride length okay if you take that and if you divide it by the leg length you get this kind of a relationship you can put human you can put a dog you can put a camel everything sort of follows this relationship where you have relative stride length and relative speed along this line okay now what we do we go to the field we measure these stride lengths 
of dinosaurs, of mammoths or whatever. We put it on this line and try to understand what was the relative speed. And now if you do that, we will find that some of the dinosaurs could actually run faster than the Olympic 100 meter uh, world record. The most impressive part is they could do it not only for 100 meters, they could do it for miles. So they could keep that very high speed for a very long time. This is how we know about behavior from those skeletons and these trace fossils. Okay. A few more details. You see all these uh, tracks. What do you do? see here? Some tiny footprints, right? This is another interesting thing about dinosaur footprints. They often show as group and the small footprints are always in the middle. What does that tell you? That tells you again another level of behavior that they used to move in a group and they are small ones, the babies were always protected in the middle where the guards, the large dinosaurs were at the side. We are talking about the same species of dinosaurs. Okay, so this is pretty much what I wanted to show and uh, you know what it takes uh, because it's a different name you don't come across all the time so you, you can kind of take a look at it. But what I want to say is you know what Supriya told you I think uh, uh, my story is also somewhat along the similar line I'll tell you what my mom still tells me that what was my mom's dream that there would be one day when my daughter would be dot dot dot. So every mom has a dream, right? My mom's dream when I was in school would be was that there would be one day when my daughter will come back from the school and she will not have any scratch or bruises or black and blue all over the body. That was my mom's dream because she couldn't believe that it, there would be a day when it doesn't happen. I was too much into athletics badminton, volleyball, all sorts of things and I was very active. Studies, yes, it was something like which I thought it was my parents responsibility and I didn't like it for a very long time because the moment you think it's the parents responsibility, it's like okay, I again have to do that, why do I care? But then something changed when I was in my 7th or 8th grade uh, when there was a workshop, okay. And many of my friends said, okay, let's participate in that. And where we were supposed to choose a topic. And I always liked something that I have no idea about. Because that would give me some excitement. Okay. And I chose something about um, how does coal form or petroleum form, something like that. And because it's completely outside our textbook, I had no idea how to proceed. So that's the first time I went to the library, the district library and started looking for you know something. I had no idea what it's called, how I'll, will I find it and this entire five uh, week thing where I tried to look for different information, tried to put it together, connect different things was the first time I got a flavor of self-study self-motivated study and something where nobody is telling me okay there is an exam and you have to you know memorize and give have good marks and that's when I realized I actually like studying it's not just the format that I was being followed in the school which I absolutely hated so you know sometimes you have, you have to tell yourself that is it the study that you hate or is it the way you are studying that you hate? And often we don't distinguish between the two and we basically give up on ourselves. We simply think that okay, and that is the first problem. You can actually do it. You simply forget what are the other pressures. Often you will find joy. And you know what Supriya told that our careers are often very unusual. We spend this enormous amount of time. My daughter often tells me, you still study. You're so old. 
so but this is the thing that there is a joy in it okay and there is another uh, you know part that i enjoy is i never get old obviously i have gray hair i have all these things um but i never get old in terms of conversation because where i am every year every month i get to interact with people who are age group 18 to 25 they keep me young you keep me young you wouldn't believe what a joyful experience that is okay and i would really hope to have some of you do it for yourself and you'll find how exciting it is uh, thank you devpriya ma'am we uh, came to know many lot of things about fossils today uh, you must have liked her study tips also